I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast, Rom Today. It's part seven of dun, our 10-part series, decade by decade, looking at the greatest writers of the 20th century in Chinese literature. We really need a theme song. We do? Why don't you write it? You, Rob, you're, you're a musician. I don't have time, dude. I'm working on a dissertation. Come on. No, I don't have whatever. time to work and th- write a theme song. Are you asleep from the hours of like 9 p.m. to the hours of like 6 a.m.? On a good day, yes. Well, not nine. We're like ten to, to six. This morning was was five fifteen, but um, that's that's the life when you when you have kids, you know. Oh, we should also mention here, uh, we're recording in a in a in a church uh, space uh, where we normally record. Your church has generously allowed us to record yeah. in your. In My wife space. and I tend to work here because there's nobody here, and the church was like, "Yeah, sure, use this empty room." Uh, but it also means Lee and I can record in person and still be socially distanced. Um, anyway, so you may hear sounds in the background because today, unlike most other days, my kids are playing at church. So those screams aren't, uh, child (laughs) sacrifice (laughs) or aren't, (laughs) we stopped that a good couple of months ago. No more child sacrifice. Y'all are no longer a truly Abrahamic religion. You're just Abrahamic in the sort of symbolic sense. We're Lutherans, dude. Come on. (laughs) Keep up. Um, yes, we're in the 1960s, Lee. 1960s are rough, man. Well, for you. (laughs) <laughs> why because well, I mean you're only knowledgeable about writers from the PRC whereas I have embraced a wider view ah, of Chinese yes. literature we'll, we'll get into that you know one of the things I should mention that has been hard about the every decade of the 20th century thing is what do we do with the Maoist era because the, the, the 50s which was our last one in this series was a little easier because there's still an effort to produce what we might think think of as actual literature, serious literature. It's not right? good, but it's, it's not, not it great, is but it's still literature. It's still recognizable. The 60s and 70s are a self-conscious attempt to get rid of anything smacking of quote-unquote art with a capital A, and the 60s doesn't really even produce any novelists of any note. I mean, they just weed the whole genre out. In order to keep our uh, uh, family safe... Uh, title in iTunes. We can't really say how we feel about the 1960s and it's 1970s. Tough. So, Rob, you mentioned the Maoist period. We're looking at the period from that. That's really referring to the period from 1949 to 1976. That's roughly when it's usually dated. Yeah, 1976. I mean, the ending is kind of a question mark on right. where that actually ends. But, but this is the the period when. China is undergoing some pretty horrific stuff politically. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the the, the listener probably yeah. knows. So we have the Great Leap Forward in the 50s. It ends in the early 60s. Mass deaths, usually, not usually, but uh, due in large part to starvation from government-mandated quotas. It's kind of comparable to the Ukrainian yes. uh, starvation. Yeah, the 60s, once again, there's kind of a cooling off period. Hmm, let's rethink this. 1961 through 1965, 66. Yes. 66 is the beginning of the great proletariat cultural revolution. This is when Mao stages a comeback uh, and tries to retake power. He'd kind of been pushed out in 19, the late 1950s out of power, and he's kind of just hanging out, writing, doing Yes, other and the Cultural Revolution, and we don't need to give the entire history. This is, again, Please something don't. you can easily Wikipedia if you want. But the gist of it, though, is that because Mao's been pushed out of power, he goes, well, I'm not going to get any help from within the party. I'm going to have to look outside the party, which and he, he does. He, and he effectively calls on the youth of the nation to purge the party's ranks of capitalist rotors, that's of another infiltrators. Way, that's another way of saying Mao loses power, and despite the fact of still having some power, he essentially starts a civil war against his own government. Yes, very much so. Um, and so the quote-unquote Red Guards that spring up around him are college-age kids, some younger than that, who are called upon to call out their teachers, anyone who seems to be not towing the party line and make them confess their crimes. This um, is the period where in Guangxi in southern China, uh, some people took this so far that they found uh, that there were uh, uh, um, instances of cannibalism. Hmm. Uh, I think maybe 138 instances of documented cannibalism in Guangxi where people would eat 
uh, people who weren't leftist enough, and particularly a group of middle school students ate their teacher for not being leftist enough. And to counter that, it's a peculiar period, too, where not everywhere was touched equally. When I was living in Shandong province, one of my early writing dreams was to interview my my neighbor who was in his 70s at the time, his old retired professor, and get the real story, quote unquote, of the Cultural Revolution from him. So I was like, so, you know, tell me, what was it like? And he was like, eh, I don't know, like, nothing much happened here. I mean, you know, like, some people marched and all that, but we kept going to class and stuff. So it was a really weird period where you had everything from cannibalism to riots in the streets to crickets chirping, nothing. Like, it, you know, it's very strange. But what it did mean was that um, if you were looking for art, you weren't going to find it anywhere, yeah. anywhere, anywhere. And I don't mean that in the aesthetic sense, like bad art. I mean, any art whatsoever. Uh, I even tried, I did a little research in this. I was going to try to find a writer. Okay. What's a great communist novelist from this era who could really define there isn't one. Yeah. Right. I mean, they just, it's all gone right from the sixties until the, the mid seventies, really until you either go abroad, not abroad, until you kind of cross the straits to Taiwan, which you're going to do, or you go underground, which is what I'm going to do. So you want to you want to introduce your person? Yeah. So my writer from the 1960s for Chinese literature is Bai Xianyong. He is a sort of Taiwanese writer, and I say sort of very carefully. Um, he was born in actually Guangxi, which we were talking about, where. Uh, where the cannibalism occurred. His father was a very important general uh, who worked for Jiang Kai-shek, Jiang Jieshi. Uh, this is uh, Bai Chong-shi, I think is uh, his father's name. Um, and he was a part of the KMT, the, the group that kind of led China from 1925, really, to, to uh, 1949, yeah. mm-hmm. um, on and off. Um, and and he was the, the the general was very important. Like the U.S. was in negotiations with Bai Xianyong's father. Um, Bai Xianyong is interesting because he was born a uh, Muslim, like his father. He attended Catholic school, and uh, he eventually wound up in the U.S. teaching, I believe, at the University of California, Santa Barbara, hmm. and uh, sort of became a Buddhist. So he's kind of uh, religiously been around the. The, the place. Um, bai Xianyong in the 1960s starts publishing a series of stories that are kind of, it, it, they eventually became a collection. I think the collection was published in 1971, but, but he starts publishing the series in the 1960s. And it's, uh, the, the collection eventually became called Taipei Ren, or just the, the people of Taipei or Taipei people, something like that. Um, and it's this fascinating collection of short stories of a very historically informed uh, writer, a writer who's trying to kind of actively, who's looking back from 1960 and actively thinking about the 1920s and the 1910s and what's going on in that period and the kind of revolution that happened and all of those, the revolutionary fervor of that period and kind of sort of being nostalgic for it or you know like it's a very historically informed nostalgia i'm thinking particularly of dong ye one of the series one of the the stories in that series taipei ren um where you have a guy uh who is a professor at an american university much like bai xinyong so i think you can say it's kind of an autobiographical story to a certain Mm. degree but this uh, professor is teaching his, trying to teach his kids about China. He's, he's in the classroom teaching about China and his kids are like, Oh, you know, this is the 1960s. We just want to like have revolution or whatever. And so he starts framing what happened in 1919 with the May 4th revolution in terms of the, the revolution going on among students in the 1960s. And Hmm. he's like, you know, the Chinese students were there. You know, we have we have several thousand years of student revolution. Yeah, this Assen- is nothing new. Yeah, essentially. Um, and it's it, it. I'm kind of like making fun of it, but it's a really good story. And and the whole collection of stories, which I believe it's been translated into English, actually, is is quite fascinating in terms of how it deals with history. Interestingly, it's called Taipei Ren. Hmm. Um, so the people of Taipei, but. It's entirely people who weren't from Taipei. Right, but that's that's one of the peculiar things about 
uh, Taiwanese literature in general is this rather fraught relationship with mainland China. Um, you mentioned nostalgia. Uh, a lot of the people who had crossed over in Taiwan who would have been writing in this period, for example, do have these memories of 1919 and, and certain, shortly after when, wow, things are getting things are getting better. We're changing things. And all of a sudden, oh, wait, no, 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 we're not. Now we're fleeing. <laughs> when? How did this happen? Just just for the listener who doesn't, who's, who's not aware, um, Taiwan was a Japanese colony until 1945. And uh, then, then the the Chinese government, run by the KMT, takes it over in 1945, and then the KMT loses the civil war with the communists in mainland China, and so many people in the KMT have to flee to China. So mm. Bai Xianyong is one of those people who who flees. Yeah, uh, and and that's kind of the the characters that he deals with in this series of stories are people who had. Exiles to almost. Flee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's on there's almost kind of Joycean nature mm -hmm. of of Taipei Ren in in this collection of stories, which makes it fascinating. Yeah, and it's 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 interesting too because you have so much of what we're used to seeing in sort of quote modern Chinese literature, you know, May Fourth Movement, et cetera, et cetera. Uh but from the outside almost, you know? Um and I don't know if you can hear crying in the background. There are children crying. <laughs> um, I guarantee they're not crying about the situation of exiles in Taipei, although they, they yeah, will, your, should be. Your kids might, actually. They might. I mean, they may know enough about that by now, you know. Uh, anyway. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it is it is a fascinating collection and, and really interesting. In some ways, the the best sort of emotional lens onto this era because— the, these are people all over China who remember well before Mao came to power. Uh, it wasn't like it was a garden spot before Mao came to power, but still, you know, there, there are people who remember times that were peaceful, times that were good. Um, and so there's a lot of things in common between those still struggling under the, the, the Maoist regime in China and those who made it to Taiwan. There's, there's, a, there's an emotional resonance there. And that's something that increasingly is disappearing in Taiwan. I should I should just point out that so my writer from the 1960s and the writer that I'm going to choose for the 1970s are both from Taiwan, and uh, I think you could say that part of the reason for that is because Chinese literature is such uh, dog poop um, during the mainland Chinese literature is such dog poop during this period. But I also would argue that Taiwanese literature sees this real flowering in the 1960s and particularly the 1970s. And you have lots of Taiwanese writers who are, who are incredibly uh, good writers. And even if, you know, the, the stuff that was happening on, in mainland China wasn't, wasn't uh, dog poop, uh, I would still probably end up choosing Bai Xianyong and the writer that I'm going to choose for the 1970s. Although I have to throw in here. Uh, that's because you're not looking underground. I mentioned underground earlier. Um, the 1960s in China is also when you start having the first real strong underground literary movements, particularly poetry. So the writer I'm choosing is Shi Zhi, um, relatively unknown, frankly, even now, unless you're in China. If you if you're in China and you're in a at a university, you likely have read Shi Zhi. Scherger started writing poetry. He's again, like a lot of writers from that era in China, he, he did his time in the PLA, the People's Liberation Army. Um, but his poetry does not read like Maoist poetry. It's very, very different. He takes some of the same sort of tropes. I'm thinking of uh, one sequence, very early sequence from the, the mid 60s, when he's talking about the sea, which is often just likened to the people in Maoist sort of propaganda and rhetoric, you know, the the, the ship of state is carried on the, the, the people, etc. Kind of very boring comparison, frankly. <laughs> but um, but Scherger turns it inside out and talks about storms on the sea and talks about... It's a very strange piece. You read it and you go, wait, what is he talking about? Just saying, what is he talking about, is extremely powerful because in the 60s, you never ask that question. If you were, if you were a published writer... It was clear what you were talking about. We should we should point out that uh, writing under communism, you had to be very apparent, crystal clear. You there, there was uh, 
there was a, a kind of understanding of literature that I think Mao himself articulated. Mao says, I think in his writings on Yana and his, his talks from Yana says that literature is supposed to be clear enough so that the workers and peasants can understand it. And if it's not, then it's doo doo. Um, and so for someone to be kind of like, I'm going to be like Im- opaque, opaque and, and strange. symbolic. That's actually like a huge literary statement. And it's and quite, it could get you, it could get you thrown in jail. Yeah. And he's still really the, 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 the spearhead of a movement that will later become called Misty Poetry, which is what I'll talk about in the next decade in the seventies. Um, but he's, he's really the one of the first major poets to actually start composing verse that a, a Western reader who's read, say, T.S. Eliot or even Emily Dickinson will understand as, quote-unquote, poetry, the capital P. Is he influenced by Eliot or Dickinson? I'd have to go back and look at my notes on that because I know when I, was, when I was in China studying at Nankai, that was a discussion about Scherger, what were his influences. Um, obviously, it was awfully hard to get copies of people like T.S. Eliot in Maoist China. So he may not have, he may have just been drawing off of a much older Chinese tradition because there's a lot of very opaque, strange stuff in, in, in the Chinese tradition. Um, but he's adopting some of the same sort of modern sensibility. There's, there's no real rhymed verse. There's no regular character patterns in the lines. Um, but you will reach the end of some of his poems and, and really not know where you're at. Um, which was on purpose. I'll talk a little more about that when we get to the next decade. Um, but I should point out one of the things that's fascinating about Scherger, and especially later later poets from other decades, is that he's someone who did what you're supposed to do as a good young communist, right? Serve in the PLA, serve the people, et cetera, et cetera, and still go, and he still looked around and went, yeah, no, that's something's no. This is not working. Something's not working. This is not someone who rebelled against the system, and went and hid in a cave, and wrote poetry. This is someone who served in the military and then then still is writing this stuff. He's a soldier, a PLA soldier, effectively writing against the regime. So is not he- necessarily publishing. None of these poems that you read in the '60s came out in any kind of collection in the '60s because it wouldn't have been published. So he's still a PLA. Uh, soldier. At I the think time by the time he writing? writes poetry, he's out of the PLA. Okay. Discharged, I believe, because he was wounded. I could be wrong about that. Anyway. Um, but I know he wasn't in the PLA when he wrote these. Um, and what's the... So, I mean, he's writing these and just kind of stuffing them under his mattress. They're, they're not published. Definitely not published. When no. do they get published? They're published later after um, the the one of the poets I'll be talking about next decade... Uh, begins getting some notoriety, especially international notoriety. Um, then people begin looking back going, hey, wait a minute. Look at these poems this guy's been writing. They're really similar. But he wrote like 10 years earlier. Um, they're not as mature. I should point this out. Uh, so the poet, the Chinese poet from the late 70s that everyone tends to know is Bei Dao, uh, who is an absolutely fascinating writer. Um, but... Uh, his poetry definitely reads like what we would think of as contemporary sort of modern poetry. Scherger is a, is a bridge. It still feels somewhat simplistic in places, like he's trying to use the same sort of Maoist style, but in a slightly different way. Like, I'm going to use what Mao's doing and encouraging people to do, but against Mao, right? At times, it feels like that. It's not necessarily the very experimental avant-garde stuff that would come in the late 70s. So, Rob, you've talked previously about how you don't like how everything, when when Westerners are discussing China, everything that's good has to be, everything that's good artistically has to be dissident literature. Right. Is this Does this qualify as dissident literature? That's going to be a question for the 70s because... Yeah, let's let's ask no, it. Let's now. ask it now. Well, <laughs> what's dissonant about it, you know, the first time I picked up a collection of this kind of stuff, uh, I was in my early twenties, which is often a period where you're like, Yeah, let's let's be revolutionary, let's be rebellious, let's find out what's out there, you know. And I read it and thought, I don't get why this is dissident. I don't why like there's no, you know, down with the system sort of stuff. This isn't rage against the machine. Uh, especially because Scherger never had a record contract that we know of. Um, but 
what it is he was a committed Marxist like <laughs> he wasn't like like Zach De La Roca or you know anybody else. <laughs> Um, but really what's dissident about it is a refusal to compose something simple or simplistic. Now, in the 70s, this gets more serious with writers going, everyone in the Maoist era is supposed to read as a group. We're all supposed to have the same thoughts, the same feelings. That's the whole point of this stuff. There's no possibility of interpreting it differently, but we want people to be able to read as individuals. The only way that's going to happen is if a lot of our poetry is a little resistant, challenging, right? You give someone a poem and no one, not everyone's going to read it the same way, right? That means that when you're reading it, you're reading it like you. You interpret it as you interpret it, right? That's that's the conscious effort in the 70s. And that's what Scherger starts, is to go, yeah, I get I get that, you know, this, the ocean is supposed to be the people, right? But what does that actually mean? Right? How does that work? What if we muddied the waters a bit? And because, you know, I am the people. I, I don't feel like that. And so he writes poetry, kind of muddying the waters, as I said, making it not simple, making it complicated, making the people be more than just this big mass that's supposed to follow the party. It's composed of, well, people. Um, Rump, is there, is there, uh, a translation of Shuja that that the listener who doesn't speak Chinese should be looking at? That's a good question, and I don't think so. I have never seen one. That does not mean that there isn't one. As I mentioned, this is kind of a transitional poet. This is not someone with the kind of international renown that Beidou would have over the next couple of decades. This is someone, the, the missing link <laughs> between the the Maoist stuff and the new stuff. So right? he's like Cro-Magnum man he's, of he, Chinese he is, He's the Cro-Magnum man of Chinese modern. Yeah, exactly. Um, 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 hey, it'd be fun to translate him, though. That'd be interesting stuff. Future work. Future project. Yes, exactly. Yeah, but you, you know, Lee, you asked me about translations of Shudra. Are there English translations of Bai Xianyong that people could pick up? Yes, it's just called, I think, Taipei People. Okay, Taipei People. That's an easy one to remember. People from Taipei, Taipei People. Um, I've read Bai Xianyong as well. He is very, very interesting. Uh, if you can't find any translations of Shi Zhi, you never know. One of us might be able to uh, provide you with one someday. Eventually. Hint, hint to all publishers. I think that's a great place to leave it, Rob. We'll see you in the 1970s with yet more not uh, above ground writers and i'll be bringing another taiwanese writer i'm lee moore i'm rob moore and this is the chinese literature podcast